Textual semantics uh, and, uh, and how contextuality, once we become aware of it, and quantum mechanics forces us to be aware of it, uh, actually shows up in all sorts of places. Uh, just to get a um, sort of a, how many people would describe themselves maybe as computer scientists, uh, mathematicians, physicists? Any other partition? None of the above. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, mean, I must apologize. I could have added natural language semantics yeah. to my list, so I would have done that. So we have a mixed, uh, which is great. And indeed, one of, one, of my, one of the points of this course is to find common structure that uh, is important in quantum mechanics, of course, with fits elsewhere. This is this sort of common denominator. The attempt to give a kind of structured account of it, develop appropriate mathematical tools for it, is what I'm calling contextual semantics. So the starting point would indeed be the foundational results about quantum mechanics, such as Bell's theorem, the Pitch and Specker theorem, and other fundamental such results, tell us that quantum mechanics, and therefore, uh, insofar as it gives us a picture of reality, it seems to give us as good a picture as we have of reality. Uh, is inherently and inescapably contextual. Well, what does that mean? Uh, well, apart from asking what the meaning of contextuality is, we can ask how can we think contextually? What, where, how should we think about the world given that the world is contextual? In particular, what kind of mathematical tools and methods are available for thinking contextually? And once we have such uh, such structures that we can identify, it then becomes very natural and indeed compelling to ask, does contextuality arise elsewhere? And the answer is, a, in fact, a resounding yes. Uh, once we are looking for contextuality, then actually it arises in all sorts of places, in, uh, for example, in computation in many, many different places, rather than actually in this case, and in many natural phenomena at much higher levels than those considered by quantum mechanics, for example, natural language cognition. So the idea is, or the hope is, to have something of a general theory that can handle many of these different situations. So this is the basic idea of contextual semantics. But the place that I want to start is indeed um, the sort of uh, quantum origins, but I want to start with something that I hope is concrete and accessible, even if one knows nothing at all about quantum mechanics. So this is something that should certainly be meaningful to any um, computer scientist or mathematician, quite and actually to any physicist independently of already assuming that we know uh, that we're thinking in terms of quantum mechanics. So I want to consider the following scenario. We have Alice and Bob, uh, uh, or Alice and Bob, uh, who are agents somehow situated on the on network. And uh, we can think that Alice has two local bit registers, which I'm calling A1 and A2. Uh, and the operation that Alice can perform on these bit registers is to load one of them into her processing unit, and then she can test to see whether that, that register is 0 or 1, contains 0 or 1. Bob is in an exactly similar situation. He has local registers B1 and B2. And what he can do is to load uh, one of them into his processing unit. So you can see okay. um, and then, uh, of course, if they both do this, we can collect their joint uh, outcome of what they observed. So, for example, here we could collect the joint outcome where Alice looked at the register A2 and found it contained 1, and Bob looked at the register B1 and found that it contained 0. Okay, so that's I hope, a very clear operational scenario. Now we can imagine them doing this in repeated rounds. 
So they keep doing this and we keep recording the outcomes. And we don't always find that they get the same answers every time they look at uh, a given uh, contents of a given register. So this is we're just observing what's happening in these rounds. And from these rounds, looking at these repeated outcomes and knowing which registers they've accessed, we can build up statistics. And from that, we can extract uh, a probability table. So for example, we can extract uh, a table that looks like this. So what does this table say? It's saying in all the events where Alice loaded her local register A1 and, and found, the, uh, found the value 1, and Bob loaded his local register B2 and found the value 0, then we're saying, for example, in, for those events, the probability of that happening is 1 eighth. So of all the possible joint outcomes, given that they've loaded those registers, uh, the probability of that particular joint outcome is 1 8. Okay. And that's just something we can observe empirically from this situation during this repeated uh, loading and examining of uh, registers. So a very natural question, of course, is if this is our observational behavior, how can we explain this behavior? What kind of uh, mechanism can we postulate to explain this behavior? So I think the, the, um, the most natural mechanism is to assume a source, what we can call a classical source. So what does the source do? On each round, it is writing a value into each of the four registers. And then whichever value it's written, if we look at, if Alice, for, if it writes, for example, as we see here, uh, the value 1 into register A2, if Alice then looks at register A2, indeed she will see the value 1. And he writes the value, the source writes the value 0 to B1, and indeed Bob looking at B1 will see the value 0. However, to account for the fact that um, um, you know, in general, the source itself may have some random element. So uh, in deciding which of these values to write in the registers, it may be sampling from the probability distribution. So that's what we're that's the situation that we're allowing ourselves. So we're not assuming that it's necessarily a deterministic mechanism, which, uh, but we're allowing any probability distribution. And if you think about it, in this case, we have 16 possible values we can assign to these four bit registers. So we just assume that there's some probability distribution on that space of 16 values, and the source is sampling from that distribution. And the question is, can this kind of mechanism, allowing for any distribution that we like on the registers, account for this actual observational behavior? So that's a question that makes uh, good sense independently of any physical theory. So let's see how we, we could reason uh, about that. Before we do that, let me just mention one uh, important point to mind the subtlety which is that uh, since we've, we've talked about a probability distribution on this source, uh, it's important to note that we're assuming that the choices made by Alice and Bob of which registers to load are independent of the source, which in probabilistic terms would translate into a conditional independence. Um, if, in fact, the source could not only determine which values appeared in the register, but which registers Alice and Bob would look at, but obviously we can cook up uh, a suitable distribution will give us any observable behavior that we like. The whole game is fixed. Uh, but if there's this independence, then we can think of this as a kind of game, what we could call a correlation game. And the point is, uh, can the source ensure that we get the degree of correlation between the outcomes witnessed in this table, uh, in the, whatever choices Alice and Bob make for which registers they look. So let's just keep that independence in mind. But what we're asking is a simple question. Is there any distribution on these values here uh, uh, which such that a, a mechanism like this source could account for uh, a behavior such as this? And in fact, we can answer this in quite a simple way. And the um, tools that we use come just from logic, really, and a very little bit of probability theory. But actually, this is what turns out, if we look at it from the right point of view, to underline what's become one of the fundamental techniques in quantum information, namely the notion of Bell and quantity. So I think this 
the fact that this is has such a simple basis in, in logic should be better understood. So let's look at this. Right, so forget about Bell inequality, forget about physics still, um, uh, but we just have some propositional formulas that call them phi 1 to phi n. Uh, and what we're uh, then thinking is that we can assign a probability to each of these formulas. And of course, what we have in mind <coughs> is exactly motivated by the kind of scenario we have here. We have some variables, things that can take value 0 or 1, which are just the, the labels we've given to these bit registers. And then a formula is describing an event, which, tell, which is some possible combination of uh, results we can get by looking at the values of these variables. And from a setup like this, where we can get statistics by repeatedly, uh, um, repeatedly going through rounds of this process, to, uh, the agents choosing registers and then looking at the outcomes, uh, we can get probabilities that we assign to these formulas. Okay. Now, uh, now we make one crucial assumption, and this is the whole content, as it turns out, of the sort of uh, idea known as uh, of how we uh, look at um, how we're able to constrain the behavior of classical sources of the kind that we were just talking about. So suppose that these formulas are not simultaneously satisfiable. So uh, I would just we're just in classical propositional calculus here. These are just very, I mean, on an operational level, these are very basic events that we do with looking at registers and so on. So there's no reason to consider anything else. So suppose that these formulas are not simultaneously satisfiable. Then, of course, any n minus one of them uh, must imply the negation of the, of the other one. Okay. So in particular, the first n minus one must imply the negation of the last. And any truth assignment making the first n minus 1 true must make the last one false. If that wasn't the case, then they would be simultaneously satisfied. Okay. So it's just logic 101. And equivalently, also logic 101, maybe the same way, uh, we, we can form the contraposition. So the, the truth of the nth one implies that one of the others must be false. Now, uh, that's just logic. Now let's apply our, uh, what we can um, see with probabilities here. And we can make the following little derivation. The first step is just the monotonicity of probability. If this event is included in that one, its probability must be less than or equal to the probability of this event. And the second step is the sub-additivity of probability. So probability 101, week 2, maybe. Um, uh, uh, so we're just saying the probability of a union is less than or equal to the sum of the probabilities. And now we take the probability of a complementary event that will rearrange with it, we get this, from which we can derive the following inequality. The sum of these probabilities, under the assumption that the formulas are not simultaneously satisfiable, is bounded by n minus 1. So this is extremely trivial, so why am I telling you this? Well, it's useful for us in answering the question that we posed. Let's look at that table again that we were looking at before. And we asked the question, could we imagine any classical source which could generate this table? Well, let's apply our little formula here. This is an example of what we call a logical Bell inequality logical because it's generated purely from a logical consistency condition. And let's apply it to this table. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a formula about each about events on each row of the table, uh, which corresponds to the events I've uh, highlighted in yellow. So here are the formulas. The first one is on the first row. It's written about the variables A and B. And it's saying that they get the same truth value. The same truth value, so both is zero or both one, which is expressed logically by, by the if and only if. And similarly for the second and third rows, okay, we get these things here. And on the fourth row, we have the event, which is when the, the variables, this, in this case a prime and b prime, get opposite values. Uh, and this is just the exclusive or of those two variables. Okay. So those are four formulas. 
Now, um, they're easily seen not to be simultaneously satisfiable. So if you start from A prime, uh, you can replace it by B according to this formula, you can replace B by A according to this formula, and you can replace A by B prime according to this formula, and you end up with B prime exclusive or B prime, which is certainly unsatisfying. So the um, assumption here is satisfied in this case, in which case, according to our little derivation here, the sum of the probabilities of these events must be bounded by, well, in our case, three, since there are four of these formulas. So the sum of the probabilities of these events should be bounded by three. However, you see that the weight of the first event is one, and the weight of each of the other events is six eighths. So we see that the sum of these probabilities is three and a quarter. So the inequality is violated. Uh, and specifically, we can say quantitatively it's violated by that much. So uh, now, you might ask, uh, did I sort of put a rabbit out of a hat or something? Because we seem to derive this with no particular assumptions. I'll let you mull on that, mull on that a bit. But let me say that implicit in, this, in, in the fact that this derivation makes sense is the fact that we have a classical source in the way that we were describing. So really, the contradiction we get by running through this example and seeing this violation is to the assumption of a classical source, which could be expressed just in probabilistically by saying a joint distribution on all the variables, which is compatible with all the probabilities we see for these events, which is to say, which marginalizes to give us back those probabilities. Anyway, let's look at another example now. Something can you point out where where things change in your calculation then? If you if you drop the assumption of a classical source. Uh, very good. So uh, I just translated that into joint distribution. So maybe you would like to tell me where in this calculation <laughs> I did implicitly yeah. use use the fact. So you see, the, the, indeed, that's, that is a good point. So, okay, let, let's do this now, why not? So um, we've assigned probabilities to these formulas. What we see is that each of these events are written just in the variables that occur on each of the rows. And that's important because those events are directly empirically accessible. I can measure A and B together I can measure A and B prime together, I can measure A prime and B prime together, and so on. So for each of those, I really have a grounding in the kind of experiments we were talking about, repeated runs and so forth, for getting those probabilities. So these are all real observable, empirically observable probabilities. Um, and and uh, on the other hand, the place where something um, where, where the assumption of the classical source appears is actually quite a modest looking place. It's just here, because when I take this union of events, or this disjunction logically, I'm putting all those variables together in a, in a, in a single formula, and I'm assuming that that has a well-defined probability, mm -hmm. which is consistent with the other probabilities that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's the only place where we go out of what really conforms to experience. But with that step, we can then, everything else goes through, uh, no, nothing else that's problematic, and we would get this conclusion. Can I reformulate that and say that you're assuming there that the events are compatible? Uh, you could say that, but uh, yes, I mean, right. So the other way of saying it is to assume, well, to assume a joint distribution is, uh, I mean, in a way, that's, I would rather not put it, I, I would say that the fact that you can't, that, that, that all events are not compatible, you can't assume that all events are compatible is actually something that follows from this kind of result mm -hmm. rather than something that, uh, that has to be assumed. But yes, that, that's what's at stake. And, and it's worth, uh, one more good question. <laughs> that it, this is not a vision human. No, not Because at all. I'm, uh, you know, I'm yes, keen on yes, this kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. But, um, sure. 
Uh, it, it can always be formulated in terms of disjoint units. The main thing is you can assign yeah. uh, probability to uh, things together, uh, all the variables together. And of course, the, the idea that you can assign well-defined values to variables independent of which other variables they live with is exactly the essence of the non-contextual view of things, which is what we're going to have to uh, abandon. Okay, let's look at another example, which shows the same phenomenon in an even stronger form. And this comes from the, uh, the construction due to Lucy and Hardy. And the reason I say that it's stronger is that I don't even have to write down the probabilities um, to see that um, there's going to be a violation of the Bell inequality. All I have to do is to write down the support of the distribution. So what you see here are entries 0 and 1. And here 0 means probability 0 and 1 means positive probability. So it's just the support of the probability distribution. And just from knowing the support, we can deduce that there has to be a violation of a logical Bell inequality. In fact, I don't even need to write all 16 items of this table. I could get away with four one in the top left and the three zeros, and still know that there would have to be a violation of the Bell inequality. So this is really a very strong, uh, uh, it, it's definitely stronger than what we saw before. And we'll come back, of course, to understanding the sense in which it's stronger. Um, so let's do the same routine as we did before. We're going to write uh, a formula for each row corresponding to the highlighted events. And you see that what I'm doing here is taking on these three rows where I have these zeros, the events which are the complement of those events that get zero uh, probability. Um, and on the top left, I just write the event where, um, where just this thing uh, holds, the conjunction of A and B. Okay, so these are four formulas. And again, it's easy to <coughs> see that these formulas are not simultaneously satisfied. So, for example, from the first and the second, I can derive not B prime. And from the first and the third, I can derive not A prime. And that's not consistent with A prime or B prime. Okay. So these four formulas are not simultaneously satisfiable, which tells us, by our result from before, that the sum of their probabilities must be bounded by three. But what can we say about this situation here? Well. What do I know about the probability of this, uh, of this event here on the second row? So now I've used up my three on those three events. But I've still got this thing, which has a one, so it has a positive probability. And that means that I get a violation of exactly whatever the probability is of uh, this event for the logical Bell inequality. In fact, uh, you can see that there's a bit of a more general version of this, where if there's a non-trivial implication, say from three of the rows, to give us uh, something which is a proper subset of the support on the remaining row, there would equally be a violation of a slightly more general kind. And by the way, something like that applies to take a standard example with the W state, the well known W state in quantum information. Okay, so we get this stronger kind of violation here. So we might conclude from these examples, answering our question, which we asked, so to speak, in all, uh, in all innocence, uh, can we explain the behavior we saw with a classical source, 
Well, we can't explain it with a classical source for the reasons that we've gone through. So therefore, maybe we can't um, explain it at all. Maybe such a thing can't happen. We have to give up on that kind of thing because it's not reasonable. How else could we achieve it? And of course, quantum mechanics is here to tell us that actually um, there's a different game we can play using quantum resources uh, and such that we can realize exactly that behavior. And more specifically, if we use an entangled qubit as a shared resource between Alice and Bob, then behavior of exactly the kind we've considered can be achieved. There's a slight variation of the reading that we're making now. If we go back to um, uh, our original picture here, this will do. So we're now going to think, not in this sort of uh, kind of registers on the bus, kind of picture, but of Alice and Bob choosing settings for measurements on the system. So the choice is, the choice between A1 and A2 is do I measure, for example, spin in this direction or spin in that direction. Uh, but with that small change in the scenario, exactly this situation could be realized. So if we use an entangled qubit as a shared resource, then this behavior can be achieved. So, um, so we have uh, spin measurements, that's a, I'll show you a better picture of the block sphere soon. Uh, we, have, uh, we have states appearing on the surface of a block sphere, and we can measure, let's think of spin measurements, they can be measured in any direction. So we, we define a direction by two, a pair of antipodal points on the, on the block sphere. I'm just talking about pure states here, uh, it's not the most general case, but this will suffice for our purposes. Uh, so we have two possible outcomes for each such measurement. Um, uh, we either get spin in the up direction or the down direction in, this, in the specified direction. So although um, there are a continuum of positions, a continuum of places on the sphere that the state could be, and a continuum of possible measurements, if we fix the state of the measurement, there are only, there's only two possible outcomes. So we get back to... Uh, a kind of discrete situation to a quantized situation here. So that's why it is a version of a bit. So it's like a bit, but with very significant differences. Um, it's, it's real stuff. This, this really happened. Spin was discovered in the 1920s with this famous experiment. Uh, you, could, you could think of sort of some magnetic beam. You could think classically that the particles sort of are spinning around like little tops are getting deflected. But if that something like that classical model was true, we should get a, a continuous smear of values on this plate for the different kind of degrees of deflection. But actually, uh, what we get, well, it's probably two very ugly smudges, but at any rate, essentially this uh, kind of discretized, out, quantized outcome, kind of spin up or spin down, uh, where the direction is <coughs> coming from where the angle is set. Okay, so that's one cube. That's the one qubit world, which is already um, has these differences from the, from the classical world. But the really interesting things start to happen when we consider multiple qubits. So, uh, and then we get the phenomena of entanglement. So here's a famous state, the Bell state, I'm within the normalizing constant. We think of it as two qubits, so maybe one is held by Alice and one is held by Bob. But we see that we can form this entangled state. And the way we can, the story we can tell about this, not everyone likes this story, but it is the standard <coughs> one, uh, the most uh, useful operational way of thinking about this, I think. So we have in this entangled state, so Alice could mention, could measure rather, her qubit in the in the zero this zero one basis. She may get zero or she may get one, but if she gets zero, then the whole state collapses to the to the to this part. And therefore, if Bob were to measure, he could now only get the outcome zero. And similarly, Alice could get the outcome one, but in that case, we would collapse to that part. And if Bob were now to measure, he could only get the outcome one. So Alice's measurement has had an effect on Bob's possibilities of measurement, even though Alice and Bob may be far, far apart. They may be space-like separated. Mathematically, this comes to uh, the fact that states of a compound system like this are represented by the tensor product. So we write a typical element like this as a, as a superposition of these different ways of combining basis states from the two individual systems. 
And of course, some of these coefficients could be zero, and then we get correlated states of the kind that we see here in the real state. And this is famously what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. Einstein kind of didn't buy it. Um, it was Schrodinger who coined the term uh, entanglement. Um, but, uh, but because it seems very strange, even if the particles are spatially separated, measuring one has an effect on the state of the other. But it turns out that despite uh, Einstein's uh, versions, reality is really like that. Maybe we don't quite understand what it means for reality to be like that, but it is. Uh, and, and the effects of entanglement can be observed, and there is this non-locality. Okay, so... Um, back to our table, and the point we can now make is that this is not just a sort of table we dreamed up. This is a table which is predicted by quantum mechanics and in the light of the many experiments that could have been done by Aspect and his colleagues and many others, we can say that this is, uh, what it's showing is, is something that's physically real. So in particular, this specific table can be generated by taking as our shared resource this entangled Bell state uh, and using measurements in the xy plane uh, on the block sphere at a relative angle pi over 3 uh, to each other. Now at this point, I would usually march on, but a couple of times people recently, and one of them is in the audience, have said to me, actually, how do you calculate these values? So I'd just like to ask, um, who would find it useful to go through a calculation, a sample calculation and how we get a table like this, or is everyone completely knows how to do this in their sleep while standing on their head. So who would like to see it? A few hands. Okay. Some people would obviously never, ever like to see it. <laughs> you leave the room if you like, but I'll, uh, I think enough people have raised their hands that I'll, I'll just briefly uh, go through how you do this. Um, just, just to give a feeling for how we can relate, I mean, we're, we're doing enough abstract stuff but just to see how we can concretely get some numbers out of the, and, and exploit the predictive content of... Um, axis itself just has this angle equal to zero, and we get this familiar representation of spin up and spin down in the direction of the x axis <coughs> itself, just as the sum or the difference of the two uh, basis vectors appropriately normalized. Okay, is everyone with me? I'm assuming that this kind of twiddling of qubits is familiar. So here's, that, that's for an example, compute this entry of the bell tape. So what are we going to do, so as we said, we're going to now interpret these formal sort of things we were calling measurements or registers or whatever by specific, uh, corresponding to specific uh, quantum measurements in the quantum sense. So I'm going to take the uh, Alice's A measurement just to be measuring in the X direction and her A prime measurement to be measuring still on the equatorial plane here but at an angle phi of which we take to be pi over 2. Um, and of course, it's important to say Alice is measuring the first qubit. We're, we're going to measure the, the Bell state here. Bob similarly has his first measurement interpreted as measuring in the direction of the x-axis and his second at the same angle, pi over 3. So th this, this is the case where Alice performs measurement uh, actually a, should be a b prime rather than a prime b. So it's that, I think it's that entry, strictly speaking. So here is Alice's, uh, so, and, and so we're interested in Alice performing measurement A, Bob performing measurement B prime, Alice seeing outcome zero, and Bob seeing outcome one. So zero is spin up, 
on this spin down. So here is um, Alice measuring A, that's the X direction and spin up. And here is Bob measuring um, in uh, uh, pi over three uh, degrees to the, um, to the uh, X axis uh, and getting the uh, results spin down. So we have to add uh, we have to add pi to the pi over 3. So this vector represents Bob's measuring B prime and getting outcome 1. Sorry, that, that should be down here. And of course, as we said, Alice is performing her measurement on the first qubit of the system. Bob is performing his measurement on the second qubit of the system. So to represent this joint event, this joint outcome, given these measurements, uh, we have to take the tensor product of these vectors, which gives us this ugly looking thing here. And what we're going to do is to measure this on the Bell state, a highly entangled state that we, uh, we were talking about over here. And of course, the Born rule, the basic rules gives us the basic predictive content of quantum mechanics, says that uh, the, the probability of getting this outcome on this state is given by this square modulus of the inner product, which is an ugly looking thing. But fortunately, it simplifies quite easily, because we, if we take this in a product, we can expand by bilinearity, and we have the fact that all these vectors are pairwise orthogonal, so most of the terms cancel. Most of the terms cancel, so we only have to look at where this thing pairs with that thing, because all the other things it could go with will go to zero, and simply where this thing goes with that thing. So from the eight possible terms we could get, we only need to worry about two of them. So the square modulus just comes down to this, uh, and then uh, we just simplify a bit. Um, Painfully remember a little high school algebra, and eventually we see that uh, bigger it does give us the number that we had at the table. Okay, so that's how one does such a uh, calculation. Um, in a way, the, the sort of nice point about this is that you get, in quantum mechanics, you get this strange detour through complex numbers and uh, this kind of geometry and so on, just to get some probabilities at the end as the concrete um, uh, operational <coughs> manifestation of the predictive content of the theory. And in a sense, the underlying question that motivates a lot of the problems of reconstruction of quantum mechanics is how can we justify sort of, uh, in, in sort of conceptual terms rather than historical terms, how we get to this representation in complex numbers, when in the end all we want to do is uh, calculate these probabilities. So these operational formulations of quantum mechanics leading in the end to a representation in the block sphere and in, in this uh, complex geometry uh, have that kind of imagination. Okay, so anyway, these are honest calculations and this is a real prediction of quantum mechanics, which we can take to be uh, very well. Uh, <coughs> okay, is everyone happy with that? Or at least uh, you've seen it, now we're going to move on. If you like, we'll never speak of it again. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's go up a, a level or two of abstraction. Um, so let's again look at the table, but now instead of actually showing how to compute it, let's derive from it a more abstract kind of structure. So uh, what's going on here in this table? So usually people are very happy just to write down these tables and, uh, and then sort of do uh, things related to them. But actually there's a much more, there's a more abstract structure which, and if we perceive it, we can see that there's things going on that really are much more general than what lies on the surface here and can also therefore be applied to a much more general range of phenomena. So, um, so let's anatomize this table from that point of view. So what we see is that the structure of this is that there are rows. And the rows are indexed by the variables that, that, that are determining the measurement choices or the choice of variables we were going to look at. And as we saw, because of the, the sort of argument with the, the, um, um, the sort of bell inequality and so forth, it's actually important that, 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 that these contexts really play an important role because we have to take the things we see on each row as really being real and empirically accessible, um, whereas we have to take ways of combining things that, that, that don't fit within these rows uh, as being in some sense inadmissible. Um, we, we can't assume that the things we get by combining variables that don't appear in the rows uh, to be empirically meaningful. If we did, we would really get a contradiction 
between logic and experience. Given that this table is real, given that our deduction of the bell inequality was logically valid, if it was admissible to really look at all the variables together, then we would get a contradiction. So I'm not here to say there's a contradiction. I'm here to say that we can't uh, I mean, come up with uh, and, you know, the, the conclusion we have to take is that we really have to take these contexts seriously. So in our case, these are, this is a simple family of contexts here. And of course, we can consider much more complicated things. Now, each measurement has possible outcomes <coughs> more than one. I, I say in particular this is simple because you can see it's a kind of representation of a Cartesian product. Alice has choices A and A prime. Bob has choices B and B prime. And all the combinations of choices are possible. That's a very simple way of putting things together. If you think of all the kind of twisted, knotted hypergraphs and simplicial complexes we could have come up with, then uh, it is very simple. And actually, in a slightly different part of the foundations of quantum mechanics, in, Coach and in the Coach and Specker territory, one does come up with rather fiendish families of things. The point is, it can be seen to be in exactly the same framework as this. Now, each measurement has possible outcome zero or one. So the basic events that we're ascribing probability to, these cells in the table, um, what, what are they? Well, they're, they're described mathematically by a function. So, for example, the matrix entry of A prime B in column 0, 1, so the one I put the yellow mark on earlier, although I should have put it on this one, uh, is just described by saying we measured A prime and got the value 0, and we measured B and got the value 1. So we're assigning a function. So really it's a function described by a function of this kind. And really what each row of the table then does is to specify a probability <coughs> distribution on events of this form for a given choice of measurement C. <coughs> so um, what we see immediately from this is that we're dealing with a pre-sheet, right? So, um, so what do we have? We have a set of measurements. Now, of course, I say, I mean, this is, this, uh, as it stands, this is discrete. But I mean, although it's discrete, that doesn't mean it's trivial. We've already seen enough to, to show that, uh, that it's not by no means trivial. Um, but anyway, we have a set of measurements. So we have a family of subsets that measurement contexts are covered. So we're now generalizing, because this will make sense in its full generality. To each such set, to each member of the cover, there's a probability distribution on these local sections where O is the set of outcomes. So in our case, the outcomes are always 0, 1. Um, but it could be, it could be any set. So the local sections correspond to the directly observable joint outcomes of compatible measurements, which can actually be performed jointly on the system. And it's these, these actually observable events to which we can ascribe empirically grounded probability. The different sets of compatible measurements correspond to the different contexts of measurement and observation of the physical system. And the fact that, as we've seen already, the behavior of these observable outcomes cannot be accounted for by some context-independent global description of reality corresponds to the geometric fact that these local sections cannot be glued together into a global section. So get this correspondence between uh, sort of geometric language and this physical and operational so here's a familiar case of gluing things together. We have some functions defined on these subsets. And provided the functions agree on their overlap, and overlap here I mean geometrically, not in the in a product sense. Um, provided they agree on their common part, the restrictions to the intersection of their domain is the same, then we can glue them together to form a function on the big set, the union. So that clearly works. But what we're seeing in, in, in exactly what the general content of the kind of result we're talking about is, is that there are obstructions to gluing distributions. In geometric language, Bell's theorem of related results says that there's a local section which cannot be extended to a global term, uh, uh, which is uh, compatible with the family of distributions. So somehow the space of local possibilities is sufficiently logically twisted to obstruct such an extension. And the quantum phenomena of non-locality and contextuality correspond to the existence of obstructions to global sections in this sense. Um, 
And in fact, and we've already sort of begun to do this implicitly, we can look not just at probability distributions, but at other kinds of distributions. In fact, when we went from looking at probabilities to looking at supports, as we did in the case of the Hardy model, we were passing from distributions valued in the non-negative reals to distributions valued in the booleans. Um, okay. Um, I, uh, let's see if I try. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, let me be slightly more specific as to what my chief is before I... Um, so who's, 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 who knows what a functor is? Oh, that's good to see. Having given talks on a number of occasions to physicists, where uh, I wouldn't even have dared to ask the question. Uh, uh, oh, it yeah. Yes, there are. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's good. Thank you. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, all right. Let's say what the um, let's say what our what our uh, functor our pre sheet is. So we have our set X as we said here. <coughs> we have our set of outcomes. So there is a functor. subset of X uh, takes us to um, now this is meant to be the distributions uh, valued in this semi-ring R on these, these events as we've just said the, the events are described by functions so we're looking at valuations of these measurements or variables as we can think of them. And for each set of variables, we can look at their valuations in this set of outcomes, O. So O is outcomes or values. And X we can think of as measurements or uh, variables. So would you mind telling us what a sub-measurement is? Excuse me. Were you mind telling us what is this, like a sub measurement, a subset of a certain measurement? Um, so is, is X built out of the unions of many different measurements? So this is the power set of X. Yeah, 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 no, but X so this is the power set of X. So we're looking at sets of measurements. Uh -huh. And therefore, uh, to say that this is a functor uh -huh. is to say that whenever. Yeah, no, this is, well, this is what I mean, so let me show you what I mean, and then you can, uh, so we have, uh, so we therefore we have this kind of relation. This is what I, this is, I want to understand what this is. Yeah, okay. so this is, so in, in our example, this could be the set of measurements A, B. On the other hand, we could have just A. So we could, we, Alice could be measuring in direction X, Bob could be measuring direction x plus pi over 3, so that's the <coughs> joint event over here. But on the other hand, we could just take the event where x measures and Bob does nothing. And actually, this ability to do these restrictions to these subsets turns out to be very important for reasons that we'll see shortly. So that's, we mean nothing more than that. Uh, but we're not assuming any particular structure on the measurements. They're just variables if you want, that we can assign values. But the important thing is which ones can we do together? So that comes back to this idea of compatibility. Uh, okay, good. So what we want to do is, given um, uh, an, or, uh, given an inclusion like this, uh, uh, as part of claiming that this is a functor, we want to have a map that takes us from um, distributions on the larger set back to distributions on the smaller set. That's what this notion of restriction is. So let's, let's come back to that. 
that's what we're just going to write with this, this sort of, uh, the same sort of notation of restriction as we would write for ordinary function restriction. But what we mean by it is, um, uh, is this thing here. Uh, so what we, what we do is to, to see what weight we should assign to something over the smaller set. We look at all the events over the larger set which it could have come from. In the, in the things in the larger context it could have come from, namely all those events that, that if you restrict the domain, you get that event in the smaller set. And we sum over the weights of all of those. Now if you think about that in the context of probability, uh, this is just the marginal of a distribution. Um, if you think about it in the Boolean case, so um, if you think about it in the Boolean case, so what is the Boolean case? Uh, the Boolean case is where we're valuing these distributions in just in the Boolean algebra 0, 1. So a, dis a distribution that sums to 1, normalized distribution, uh, with, uh, we, we, assume these, uh, we assume the support is finite. Uh, a Boolean distribution is just a finite non-empty subset. So if we take the case of uh, Boolean distributions, um, then this is just finite non-empty subsets. And uh, if you think about what, uh, and then the, um, uh, the summation becomes a disjunction. The summation becomes a disjunction. And wh what this amounts to is we're taking a set of values, a set of these events or functions or tuples as we can think of them, and we're, we're forming the setwise, um, we're, we're taking the projection setwise. So we're taking a set of tuples and we're forming the set of all things that restrict to. Um, so that's what we would get in the Boolean case. We'll come back to that uh, in the next lecture and see that it's an example of a very familiar operation in computer science. Samson, why are the distributions finite? I understand non empty in the Boolean. Why, why are the, well, I'm assuming, well, I'm, okay, I mean, for these purposes, I'm defining my distributions to have, uh, to have finite support. So by, by definition, I take dr of x. That, okay, let, let's actually write this explicitly. Uh, so what is dr of x? That is, that is what I'm taking as my definition here. So this is a well-studied thing, of course, in computer science as a discrete distributions monad or the discrete version of the um, Jury monad and so forth. Um, it's not a necessary restriction, but it's, it just keeps things simple and points there is taken account. So these are supposed to be all uh, probability distributions? Yes. Uh, and more precisely, if R is the non-negative reals, this would exactly be the set of all probability distributions of finite support. If R is the booleans, as here, it's exactly the set of all finite non-empty subsets because disjunction, because summation is disjunction. And if it was the reals, then it would be all the signed normalized measures, measures where you can have negative as well as positive values. And actually, that may sound like a weird thing, but it comes in in an interesting way at some point. Uh, and in fact, um, if we analyze what's going on in our, uh, in our, the reason I'm writing it like this is because, and, and uh, if you look at it equally here, you see it's really a composition of two things. It's a composition of nothing more than the contravariant Hong functor, just taking functions into a fixed set. <laughs> And then this distribution is functor. If you compose the two, you get a functor again, and it's contravariant, so it's a sheaf, and in fact, it's this thing. So we can read off 
this restriction just by knowing the, uh, what this functor is and what this op functor is. If that isn't familiar, it doesn't matter because concretely this is the definition that we're going to work with. Okay, all right. Um, let's uh, go a little bit further. I'm going to have to stop in about three minutes. Um, so, uh, what we're doing is, is going towards making uh, an abstract setting for the structure that we've seen. So, um, so, here we mentioned the set of values and the outcomes, but we haven't used this cover yet. And obviously the cover is important because that's where this restriction to compatible families of measurements is. Mm -hmm. um, so, where does that come from? Firstly, what is this thing? Uh, we don't call it here a measurement structure. It's just a family of subsets uh, which covers the whole set of measurements. So actually, in, just in purely formal terms, um, this, this is just a hypergraph, a hypergraph on X. It's a family of subsets of X. Um, and allowing ourselves, I mean, we're not placing any particular restrictions on this, and that gives us some useful generality. For example, a particular case, which is what we've been studying so far, is if we start off with disjoint sets of labels for measurements by Alice and Bob, the labels of the context will be, in a sense, this kind of cross product. All the combinations picking out one thing from each set, the transversals, in fact, of this family. So really, we're forming the usual situation where Alice can choose any measurement and Bob can choose any measurement, and that's compatible. The usual justification for that is exactly that they are well separated from each other physically. So Alice can do whatever she wants independently of Bob, Bob can do whatever he wants independently of Alice. There's not even enough time for any signal to go between them uh, to that the, the, what one chooses to measure is going to have an effect on what the other the measurement structure is exactly the set of all pairs like that. So the, the, set, the underlying set X, okay, so let's write it out exactly in these terms. So the underlying set X is a disjoint union of XA and XB. So there's the, the, uh, this disjoint, right? And then the, so the measurement structure is a family of subsets, which is exactly this this family is a family of subsets of this set. Okay, so we're just picking one from A and one from, one from A's set and one from B's set. <coughs> and of course, if you had n parties um, and each one of them had any set of measurements, you could do the same thing. You would get one of these well type scenarios. So um, that's one particular case, but it's a very special case. And to take another case that's important in quantum mechanics, we have Koch and Specker configurations. Um, where you have a set of vectors, um, and you look at the family, yeah, so that's our underlying set. Um, it can include zero, right? Otherwise no, 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 actually I should have said unit vectors. Yeah, okay. okay. Unit vectors would have been better, yes. Particularly yeah. as I say orthogonal basis. Yes. So X is a set of unit vectors say an Rn, some fixed n, and then we form the family of subsets which, which are which are orthog mutually orthogonal. So that's an interesting example of getting such a measurement structure. And actually here is an example of such a measurement structure. So you see you can look quite different to the bell type scenarios. This is a family where the underlying set of elements has 18 things, uh, which I've labeled by the letters A through <coughs> the last one I used is. So it has 18, 18 different letters in there. That's the underlying set. And then the cover is composed of nine sets of columns in this table. Each of those sets contains four, um, it contains four of the elements of our underlying set. And the important property that these have is that we can label these letters with unit vectors in R4 such that the vectors in each column are orthogonal. Show you that labeling now, but the, the consequence of that is that it yields a proof of the coaching specter theorem. We'll, we'll come back 
for that. It's one of the sort of most economical witnesses of quantum contextuality in the form of the first aspect of the time of the But combinatorially, it, it is exactly an example of the situation we're dealing with. Okay, so, um, we'll, so next time we'll sort of follow through this program of giving the abstract structure of underlying these tables and see how to understand um, <coughs> and contextuality in terms of obstructions to global sections. So I'll stop there.